Welcome to the Radio Plays Project. In this episode, we present two adventure plays from the golden age of radio, originally produced as live radio dramas with sound effects and scripted advertising from the period. The Radio Plays Project is produced by the Department of Theatre and the Mask and Hammer Theatre Club for SUNY Oneonta, featuring the work of our students and faculty. The project explores written work by new and nationally recognized playwrights, as well as traditional works from the golden age of radio. During the 1940s, live radio serials were extremely popular and were typically underwritten by business sponsors who used the daily broadcasts as promotional platforms. Two of the most successful were Superman and The Adventures of the Thin Man, which famously followed the crime-fighting couple of Nick and Nora Charles and their faithful canine companion Asta. In this episode, our first short feature is drawn from a 1945 broadcast of the Superman series entitled Meteor of Kryptonite. The broadcast includes the famous team of Perry White and Lois Lane as friends and colleagues of mild manner reporter Clark Kent and his super-secret alter ego, Superman. Kellogg's Pep, the super delicious cereal presents The Adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman. And today we begin a brand new adventure for the Man of Steel. An adventure that is to test all his great and unusual powers to the utmost. A strange and dramatic scene is taking place in the private office of editor Perry White of the Daily Planet. Clark Kent, his face ashen gray and hands clutching the arms of his chair, is staring at the late afternoon edition of the paper on White's desk. The editor, alarmed, has risen and is about to go to Kent's assistance when the door opens and Lois Lane enters. Clark, I want to ask if you'd... Good heavens, what's the matter? Get some water, Lois. No, 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 I'm all right. What happened? Don't stand there asking questions. Get some water. I hear you. You don't have to scream at me. Please, Chief. I'm okay. Beanie, bring some water. Now, can't you be quiet? Don't try to talk yet. What happened, Chief? I don't know. We were sitting here talking What? I'm all right now. There's nothing the matter with me. There certainly is something the matter with you. You're pale as a ghost. I don't want anyone in here. It's Beanie with the water. Here you are, Miss Lane. Here, Clark, drink this. I'm I'm really all right now. Well, drink it anyway. Water never hurt anyone. Here, go ahead. <clears throat> there. Don't get up. I'll take the glass. I'm all right. Leave it on the desk. Okay. Now, now, can't you just sit back and relax now? Do as I say. All right. All right. I'm sorry I caused all this trouble. I, I... Will someone please tell me what happened? It was nothing, Lois, really. It must have been something, because when I walked in here, your face was the color of the chief's hair. What's the matter with the color of my hair? There's nothing the matter with it, but it's gray. (laughs) When you're as old as I am, yours will be gray, too. I don't doubt that for a moment. Now, what happened? You started to tell me, Chief. It was nothing, Lois. Believe me. You keep quiet. Now go ahead, Chief. Oh, thanks. Good grief. Isn't it possible to carry on a normal conversation around here without sarcasm or screaming or jumping down people's throats? I'm asking a simple question. What happened in here that made Clark look like a ghost? If you'd only stop talking long enough for another person to get a word in edgewise, maybe you'd find out. There's nothing to find out. You keep out of this. I'm waiting, Mr. White. You too. Me too what? You too. Oh, 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 never mind, never mind. I better tell you what happened before you drive me crazy. Mm-hmm. Now we were sitting here talking. I don't remember what about. That's not important. When someone came up from the press room with a copy of the early afternoon edition of the paper. Who? What's that difference who? 
A guy from the press room, a guy named Joe. All right, all right, golly. You put the paper on my desk? Here, here it is. We went right on talking. I got a phone call, and while I was on the wire, Kent leaned over and glanced at the front page of the paper. Next thing I knew, he looked like he was going to die right in that chair. Now, now, wait a minute. That is, that's a slight exaggeration, Chief. You certainly looked that way when I came in. Well, maybe I'm tired. Maybe I need a vacation. Right now, I've got some work to do in my office. You come back here and sit down. Let him go, Chief. See you all later. Darn fool. Lois, I... I'm worried about him. Maybe he does need a vacation. Wait a minute. Let's see what's on the front page of the paper that might have shocked him. I, I can't imagine any news story having that effect on him. MacArthur warns Japs against sabotage. President asks for tax reduction. Coal strike pending. Noted meteorologist dies. Five rescued from fire. That's all except for the weather report. Maybe it wasn't anything in the paper. Clark has been acting strange lately, Chief. As though he were hiding something. Hmm. What's he got to hide? It might be anything. You know as well as I do, Chief, that Clark isn't really a normal person. There's something peculiar about him. What do you mean, peculiar? Well, it's hard to put into words. But ever since I've known Clark, I've had the feeling that... that he's leading a double life. That he's keeping something undercover. Oh, bah! You and your double life. Well, I have... Uh, ha ever since that trial, you've had double life on the brain. He's as honest as the day's long. Oh, he's honest enough. Good heavens! Now what? I think I know it shocked him. Something on the front page of the paper? Yes, this item right here. Noted meteorologist dies. Dr. John Whistler, head of the Department of Meteorology of the Metropolis Museum, died at the city hospital this morning following a brief illness. I know, but why should that upset him so? Now listen, you remember about a year ago a strange meteor fell on a field outside the city? Hmm, faintly, yes. Well, Clark covered that story. The meteor was turned over to this Dr. Whistler, and... And Clark interviewed him at the museum. I remember now that there was something peculiar about the meteor. Uh, the details are a little hazy now, but... Well, let's call Ken in and ask him how about how he's doing... No, no, wait a minute. Let me think. Let's see. It... Kryptonite! That's what it was! What are you talking about? The meteor. Dr. Whistler called it kryptonite. It was a piece of the planet Krypton. Stop giving me double talk. Uh, I... What's uh, all this got to do with Ken keeling over? I don't know. But there must be something that... I'll get it in Yes, Mr. White. Oh, Miss Backrack, tell Clark Ken I want to see him. He's gone for the day, Mr. White. Where'd he go? I think he said he was going home. All right. Well, now what do you make of that? First he says he's got work to do, and then he goes home. If you want the truth, I'm worried. I think I'll stop off at his apartment and have a talk with him. Well, I'll go along with you. Good. Shall we leave now? Well, we might as well. I'll get my hat and coat, and I'll meet you at the elevator. Concerned and puzzled about Clark Kent's condition, Lois and Perry White decide to visit him at his apartment. What will they learn? We'll return in a moment to find out. But first, say, here's more of that exciting news. It's about the swell offer Kellogg's Pep has for you. Kellogg's Pep has a smart-looking, streamlined, real sundial wristwatch for you. One that you can wear on your wrist wherever you are to tell you the hour of the day by the sun. And in a minute, I'm going to tell you how you can get it. It's the modern 1945 version of an instrument that's been part of a man's life since the days of ancient Egypt. It's about the size of the usual wristwatch, and it's made from gleaming aluminum with a strap that holds it flat on your wrist. To use it, you lift the pointer and aim it due north. The sun's rays will make the shadow of the pointer fall on the dial, showing the hour of the day. Boy, what fun you can have playing cops and robbers and meeting when the shadow falls at three. Now, here's how you get this grand Kellogg's Pep offer. Ask mom to get a good supply of Kellogg's Pep at the store. Then send two box tops marked top from Pep Packages along with 10 cents in cash and your name and address clearly printed to Superman, Box 157, Battle Creek, Michigan. And now, 
back to the adventures of Superman. Alone in his apartment, Clark Kent, obviously troubled, is pacing back and forth across the living room floor. At intervals, he stops short and stands with shoulders hunched, lost for a moment in deep thought. And through it all, another voice, the voice of his conscience, perhaps, keeps talking to him. You've got to do something about it. You've got to. What, what, what can I do? That piece of kryptonite. You remember what effect it had on you? Yes, yes, of course I remember. It, it robbed me of all my strength. It, it made me weak. That's right. And what could a Superman without strength? That kryptonite must be destroyed. But how can I get near enough to it to destroy it? I told you, it, it robs me of all my strength. You've got to get someone to help you. Where is it? Well, it's in Dr. Whistler's private vault at the museum. He, he sealed it up at my request, but now he's dead. They'll open that vault and, and they won't know the power of that piece of kryptonite. They won't know that it makes Superman a weakling. Why do you speak of Superman as though you were someone else? It's you we're talking about. You are Superman. It'll make you a weakling. Oh, must you remind me of it? Why do you think I almost keeled over in Perry White's office? I, I knew the danger the moment I saw that item in the paper that, that Dr. Whistler had died. Well, maybe they won't open the vault. Has that ever occurred to you? Well, yes, but it's not likely. I'm in constant danger unless that piece of kryptonite is destroyed. Why, I have enemies all over the world, clever enemies. What if it fell into their hands? There's only one answer. You have to tell someone. You'll have to get someone to help you. But how can I reveal my identity? That's a secret I've guarded for years. <laughs> What's that? Someone is at the door. Good Lord, Lois and Perry White. Well, this is your chance. Tell them this story. Get them to help you. Oh, no, 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 no. I, 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 I can't. You've got to. Go ahead. Uh, 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 just a moment. I'm, I'm coming. Oh, well, hello. What, what, what brings you two here? We thought we'd stop by to see how you were. Uh, may we come in? Oh, sure, sure, yeah, of course. Oh, I'm, I'm fine now. I, I feel like a million dollars. Now, look, Ken, let's not beat about the bush. There's something wrong with you. You're not yourself. <laughs> Why, what, what, what do you mean, Chief? Lois has the idea you're hiding something. Hiding something? Clark, do you know anything about a piece of kryptonite? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's the matter? <laughs> nothing, nothing. You see, I was right, Chief. There is a connection. What are you talking about, Lois? Now we want the truth, Kent, straight from the shoulder. You're in trouble, and we know it. We're ready to help you if you'll tell us what's wrong. Uh, b b believe me, Chief. I... Clark, be sensible. When you read about Dr. Whistler's death in the Chief's office, you almost fainted. No, no, you're, you're, you're just... The same thing just happened a moment ago when I mentioned the piece of kryptonite. Uh, well... There must be some connection. The right. There is some connection. Now sit down, Kent, and tell us all about it. Remember that we're your friends. We'll move heaven and earth to help you if we can. Well... <sighs> it's a long story, and part of it's going to amaze you, but... I suppose I'll have to tell it. Go ahead, Clark. Anxiously, Lois Lane and Perry White lean forward in their chairs as Clark Kent draws a deep breath and begins his story. What is he going to tell them? Is he finally, after years of guarding the secret, going to reveal his double identity? Reveal that Clark Kent and Superman are one and the same person? This is a tense moment, a moment for which many of us have been waiting. So be sure to tune in tomorrow, same time, same station, for the adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Fellows and girls, be sure to follow the adventures of Superman. Brought to you every day, Monday through Friday, same time, same station, by the makers of that super delicious cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And for other thrilling adventures of Superman, see your local newspaper. Superman is also a copyrighted feature appearing in the Superman BC publications. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. That was Superman, 
The Meteor of Kryptonite, Episode 1, from a September 1945 airing on the Mutual Broadcast System. Our cast for this performance was Leo Frascatore as the announcer, Jocelyn Shepard as Lois Lane, Julian Gotianko as Perry White, Carla Ribeiro as Beanie Backrack, and Michael Crolder as Clark Kent and Superman. Live Foley sound effects were provided by John Bagby and Emily Hallenbeck. Our next performance brings us from the offices of the Daily Planet to the crime-solving adventures of Nick and Nora Charles. Originally created by Dashiell Hammett in his 1934 novel The Thin Man, Nick, a retired detective, and Nora, his wealthy heiress spouse, were featured in films, radio plays, and television adventures for more than 30 years. In our second feature, we join Nick and Nora for a Valentine's Day adventure written just for the radio in 1942. Woodbury presents The Adventures of the Thin Man. There's Asta's happy bark, the signal of another adventure of the Thin Man. Brought to you each week at this time by Woodbury Face Powder and Woodbury Cold Cream, those twin aids to the loveliness of your skin. Nikki? Uh, yes, dear? Do you know what Saturday the 14th is? Oh, uh, the day after Friday the 13th. Nick Charles, you've got about as much romance in your soul as a... As a clam. <laughs> On half shell? No. Steamed. All right, dear. I'll bite. What plays on Saturday the 14th? Well, maybe this little poem will refresh your memory. <clears throat> because you're charming, beautiful whack, with oodles of dough, which is no drawback, because in you alone I find the best points of the following women combined. Venus de Milo and Helen of Troy, Scarlett O'Hara and Myrna of Loy, the Queen of Sheba and Madame du Barry, and Osa Johnson on a safari. But wise as you are, can you figure out this is a proposal, darling? Will you be my missus? Oh, that is, that's awful. <laughs> you ought to know, dear. Huh? You wrote it. Me? Yes, on a St. Valentine's Day not so long ago. Darling, a worse piece of slander I never heard and... <laughs> Say, come to think of it, it wasn't half bad. Did you hear that, Asta? Oh, uh, don't move, beautiful. I'll be back in a jiffy. Just a second. Yes? You Nick Charles? That's right. My name is Stuart. Yes? I've got a little valentine for you. It's from Bill Carroll. Bill Carroll? Yeah, you ought to remember him, Mrs. Charles. Your husband sent him up for murder. What does Carroll want? Well, first of all, he don't like the big house. Oh, that's a shame. I suppose he finds it confining? A little. So he wants you to know he's going to be moving out one of these days. And then he'll be paying you a little visit. Does he? Does he have to? Well, the boss is like this. He always pays his debts, and he figures he owes you two plenty. If you know what I mean. Get out. Take it easy, Charles. I, go on, get out. <laughs> okay. That's the way you feel. A happy Valentine's Day, folks. Nick? Nick, what did he mean? Uh, nothing, dear. He was just bluffing. I don't think he was. Now, beautiful, you know better. This isn't the first mash note we've ever received from a crook. But Carol's no ordinary crook. You once told me he was the smartest criminal you ever knew. <laughs> and look what it got him. A one-way ticket to the chair. But if he breaks out... Oh, darling, the name is Carol. Not Houdini. You know it's impossible to break out of state penitentiary. Yes, dear. But what worries me is, does Mr. Carroll know it? All right, Mr. Carroll. Here's your visitor. He can have five minutes. Thanks. Hello, boss. How are you? Fine. Sit down, Stuart. Thanks. I trust you took care of that little matter? 
Do you mean that I see Nick Charles in his fro? The answer is yes. Excellent. Yeah, well, it was an awful waste of time if you ask me. I wasn't aware that I asked you, Stuart. Now, don't get me wrong, boss. I just mean Charles knew you were bluffing all along. <laughs> he did? Yeah. And Mrs. Charles? Well, if it's any consolation, she swallowed the whole yarn. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So the lovely Nora didn't think I was bluffing. Well, of course. I put on a good act for her. <laughs> Stuart, you're priceless. What do you mean? You poor fool. Can't you get it through the void you call a brain that I have no intention of donating my body to her? Electrical research. True, it's not a very handsome body, Stuart. <laughs> but then it's the only one I have. And naturally, I've grown quite fond of it. Then what I, what I told Nick Charles was the truth all along. <laughs> Comes the dawn. But it can't be done, boss. How are you going to bust out? Oh, the details are quite sordid. Money, you know. You mean you bribed one of the guards? Two, to be exact. Suppose they get caught. Impossible. Has, hasn't it ever occurred to you, my boy, that both of us have a similar physical appearance? All right. So we're both built alike. So what? Well, for the sake of argument, suppose you are visiting me. Like I am now. <laughs> Yes, like you are now. And at the conclusion of our little chat, the prison lights were to fail. Accidentally, of course. Of course. And in the resulting confusion, the guard makes an understandable mistake. He takes you for me. And then what happens? Well, naturally, while the poor chap is so confused, it would be a simple trick to disarm him. Certainly no one would think he was negligent. It's too obvious, Carol. I don't like it. I'm afraid that doesn't alter the situation any, Stuart. Its simplicity is what appeals to me. Well, if you're satisfied. I am. Perfectly. Okay. When does this break come off? <laughs> right now. Right now? Are you kidding? Stuart, I wish you could see the expression on your face. It's delightful. But why don't you give me a little time so I can round up a couple of the boys and- Exactly what I don't want. Too many actors often spoil the play to get in the way of the leading man. What time is it? Ten after seven. Then I think it's high time the curtain went up on our little drama. Stuart, yours is the privilege of reading the opening lines. I want you to rattle on the cell door and demand that the guard let you out. I don't get it. Do as you're told. Okay. Hey, let me out of here. A little more impatient than you wish to. Come on, let me out. Hold your horses, mister. I'm coming. Well, hurry up. I ain't got all day. Take it easy, buddy. Everything's set, Mr. Carroll. When Joe sees me open the cell door, he's going to short the fuse. Excellent. Come on, let me out of this rat trap. Make it look good, Carol. I don't want to lose my job. You can depend on us, Walter. We shall give a portrayal worthy of an Academy Award. Okay. Here goes. Now, mister, you... Hey, what happened to the lights? Turn them on. Turn them on. Hey. All right, Carol, here's my gun. Ah, oh, thank you. You better hit me once to make it look real. I'll do better than that, Walter. Oh. Hey, boss, what's the idea of plugging him? <sighs> but this drama like Stuart was a chapter of realism. And there's nothing that helps it as much as a corpse. Nikki. Huh? It's the front door again. One of us should answer it. <sighs> you. Oh, no, dear. You're the... Master of the house, go on. All right, but it's times like this that make me wonder if I was smart to give up bachelorhood. I'm coming, I'm coming. Hello, Nick. Carol? <laughs> Surprised to see me? A little. Nick, it isn't. F <gasps> I'm, I'm afraid it is, Mrs. Charles. The bad penny, you know. Always turning up. May I come in? 
with that gun so flanking you, it wasn't too much good to say no, would it? Well, they say, Nick, there's no percentage in arguing with a gun. Close the door, Stuart. Right. The last we heard, you were in jail. What's the expression? Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. How many guards did you have to kill to prove that? Just one, but he was a mercenary fellow. Oh, no, Nick, I wouldn't move any closer to that desk. I'll take your word for it that you've got a gun there. Yeah, I'd like to show it to you. It'd be a mistake. Stuart here is an excellent shot. Say, boss, how about stowing the gab? He's got something there, Carol. With the heat on, cops ought to be swarming over this place in a few minutes. (laughs) Nick, I don't think you have the faintest idea why I came here. I can guess. Really? Nick! Nick's very good at games. <laughs> yes, he's marvelous. Well, suppose he gives me a demonstration. Why did I come here, Nick? Listen, Carol, if you think I'm going to crawl. Oh, my dear fellow, you must judge me. I haven't the slightest intention of shooting you. No. No, I've got a much better idea. I gave it a great deal of thought. You needn't have bothered. <laughs> it was a pleasure, I assure you. Why, many an enjoyable night I spent thinking of the best way to repay Nick for his many kind offers. And you decided? <sighs> to the point, eh, Nick? Well, I decided the best way to make you suffer is to separate you from your most precious possession. You mean money? <laughs> Mrs. Charles, you underestimate yourself. Nick? Easy, beautiful. Carol, you wouldn't dare try it. <laughs> Stuart, will you get Mrs. Charles' coat? Take your hands off her, Carol. Put down that chair, Nick. Nick, please. I'll be all right. I warn you, Charles, you're making a very stupid and childish gesture. Put down that chair and stay where you are. Nick, don't! Look out, boss. <laughs> Take it easy, Nick. The doc ought to be here any minute. Ugh. What happened? You stopped a slug in your shoulder. I stopped a... Guffy. Guffy, what are you doing here? I decided to pay you a little call after headquarters got a flash that Carol busted out. I kind of figured he'd be headed this way. Where's Nora? Huh? Where is Nora? I couldn't say for sure. She wasn't here when... Uh. Now, Nick... Don't you think you ought to lay down? Let me up. Take it easy, pal. You've got a bullet in you. Let me up. Now, Nick, you don't want to carry on this way. We'll find Nora. Just give us a little. Nick, don't be a fool. Give me that gun. Get out of my way, Cuffy. You're letting yourself in for a mess of trouble. I said, get out of my way. For Pete's sake, man. Have you gone crazy? You don't know what you're doing. Nick? Where are you going? On a little exterminating job. I'm going out to kill a rat. Here's Louie, Mr. Charles. Thanks, Eddie. Will there be anything else? No, just uh, shut that door behind you. I got you. Well, Louie, long time no see. Sit down. Ow. Watch the shoulder. Gee, I'm sorry. Skip it. Nick, you should have sent for me. You'll give the boys wrong ideas. Don't fool yourself, Louie. Every hood in town knows you're a stoolie. No more, Nick. I quit it. Ah, cut it out. I am in no mood for comedy. Start singing for your supper. I swear, I don't know a thing. You're lying. Honest, I ain't. I ain't got a single idea where Carol's hiding out. I had you know I was hunting for Carol. You! You said so! I did not. Come again. Well, it's all over town. Everybody knows. You've been in a dozen places looking for him. Where is he? I give you my word, Nick. I don't- (gasps) Quit it, Nick! You're choking me! You gonna talk? You must have a couple of ideas. All right, let me go! (sighs) Gee, Nick, why do you wanna- Come on, pigeon. Spill it. Have you tried Bunny's place? What happens there? There's a running card game in the back. Big chip stuff, no pikers. Go on. Carol used to sit in the game every once in a while. 
Is this on the level? I swear it is. You might even run into some of his boys there. That's where they hang out. Heaven help you if you're lying. Honest I ain't, Nick. But you want to watch yourself. They're a tough bunch. They play for keeps. Good. That's just the kind of game I'm looking for. Hello, boys. Beat it, pal. You're in the wrong queue. I, I don't think so. I'm looking for Bill Carroll. Well, you won't find him here. He's in stir. Well, he busted out, or haven't you heard? I only hear what I'm supposed to, mister. That's something you could learn. Let's get on with the game. Throw him out, bunny. I wouldn't try it. This gun is not loaded with blanks. Now, I want some information, and the quicker I get it, the sooner I'm out of here. Go on. Answer it. Me? Yes. And no cracks if it's Carol or one of his boys. Hello? Hello, Bunny? Yeah? This is Stuart. I'm listening. Is there a potty there looking for a boss? That's right. Let me talk to him. What? It's all right. Put him on. Okay. I guess you know what you're doing. It's for you, chum. Hello? Hello, Charles. Who is this? Stuart? Don't ask so many questions. Go on home. Listen, Stuart, I'm not leaving until- I said, go home. You'll find your wife there. What? You heard me. She left here ten minutes ago. Nora? Nora, darling. Nick? Nick, are you all right? Am I all right? I saw Carol shoot you. I didn't know what- It was just a scratch, dear. I forgot all about it. Honest, I did. Now, darling, you mustn't cry. What'll last to think? You big lug. I thought I'd never see you again. Well, that was just wishful thinking, sweetheart. Here, let me look at you. <laughs> Have I changed much? <laughs> Hardly any. As she has to. Well- Maybe that's because I was only gone three hours. Are you kidding? It was three years. No. Well, maybe I'm thinking of how much I aged during that time. Oh, you poor darling. Say, how come Carol changed his mind? Don't tell me you're sorry. Well, not very, but I just can't understand why he did it. Neither can I, dear. All I know is... Excuse me, honey. Come in. Hello, Nick. Why, it's Guffy. Yeah, it's me. Guffy, look, Nora's back. So I see. What's the matter, Sergeant? You don't seem very pleased. Oh, I'm tickled to death. When did you get here? About half an hour ago. What about you, Nick? Just a few minutes before you did. I don't get it. First Carol shoots you and kidnaps Nora, and now you're back together again. All in a couple of hours. How do you figure it? I don't. I just count my blessings and give thanks. Well, it's an interesting problem. What's your guess, Nora? I don't think there is a logical answer, Sergeant. There must be. All we have to do is find the right combination. Where did they keep you, Nora? At some apartment on the west side. How did you know it was the west side? Why, I- Wait, wait a minute, dear. <laughs> Guffy, is this your idea of third degree? Third degree? You're a little touchy tonight, aren't you, pal? Go on, Nora. Well, I knew it was the west side because I could see the Hudson River. They keep you locked in a room? Uh-huh, for almost two hours, and then something funny happened. What do you call funny? Maybe I should have said peculiar. I heard Carol and Stuart quarreling in the next room, and about half an hour later, Stuart unlocked my door. He told me that Carol had changed his mind and that I could go home. <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? You took the words right out of my mouth. What do you mean, Guffy? Well, Nora called it herself. The story ain't kosher. What difference does it make? The important thing is that she's back. Well, that's one way to look at it. Where were you during all this time? Around. Just around, huh? That's right. The last time I saw you, you were carrying a heater. Mind if I look at it? Uh, what for? Just humor me, pal. Put it down to an old man's whim. That's funny. I, 
I had it in my coat pocket. I, I know. It must have dropped out when I hopped into the cab. That's too bad. You're generally not that careless, Nick. Look, Guffy, you don't have to play Dick Tracy for us. What's behind this routine? Nick, I pleaded with you to play ball. I told you if you give us half a chance, we'd find Nora for you. But would you listen to me? No, you couldn't wait. Do you blame me? No, but I do blame you for taking the law into your own hands. Darling, what's he trying to say? Don't ask me. It's no use, Nick. We found Carol's body. You what? We found his body. He was murdered. Murdered? Yeah. Nick, I hope you cook yourself up a decent alibi. Because, brother, you're going to need it. <sighs> no, Nick. That was a mistake. You never should have killed Carol. But Guffy, Nick didn't. Just because he hasn't an alibi is no- uh, Never mind, sweetheart. Have you ever known Guffy to be wrong? If, if he says I killed Carol, then I did. Well, Guffy, how about trotting out your corpse now that I've confessed? I mean, why else would you take us to the city morgue? You're a very comical fellow, Nick. Okay, we'll see if you can get a laugh out of this. <gasps> Don't look beautiful. He ain't a very pretty sight, is he? Uh, no. Would you mind telling me what was used on him? Now, Nicky, were you trying to kid? You didn't forget that fast. My memory's bad. You used sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid? You mean I poisoned him with it? No, that's how you mutilated his body. Why do you suppose I did that? To prevent us from identifying him and tying his murder onto you. Well, apparently it wasn't very successful. Where'd I slip? On the fingerprints? No, the acid took care of that. You left a cleaner's mark in his coat. That's the way we traced him. Mm, kind of stupid of me to miss You couldn't help it. It was in the sleeve lining. We had to tear the coat apart to find it. As long as you're being cooperative, Guffy, uh, riddle me this. If I didn't kill him with the acid, what did I use? All right, wise guy. Wait till I open his shirt. There. Oh, I shot him, huh? Right through the heart. Oh, Carol never had a heart. Nick Charles, I've stood all of this I can. How long are you and Guffy going to continue this farce? It's no farce, Nora. If Nick thinks it's funny, he's got a screwy sense of humor. But you can't believe Nick killed him. No? Well, then who did? Well, it could have been any one of a... Uh, Stuart! What? Uh-huh. Stuart killed him. <laughs> now, wait a minute, beautiful. Nick, I'm positive he did. I heard him fighting with Carol, and wouldn't that explain why he released me? Yeah, but it wouldn't explain why he mutilated the body. That's obvious. It would give him more time to get out of town before Carol was identified. Uh, why don't you have your men pick him up? Where do you think they are now? They're watching all the railroads and bus lines and airports. What about the steamship lines? Steamship lines? Well... It'll make you feel better. I'll check them the first thing in the morning. That may be too late. Wouldn't it stand to reason that Stuart will sail on the first boat available? What about that, Guffy? Well, just so you won't squawk later that we didn't give you the brakes. I'll call the customs office right now. But this is an awful waste of the taxpayer's money. Customs, Mitchell speaking. Hello, Mitch. This is Guffy of the Homicide Bureau. How are you, Guffy? Fine. Say, Mitch, I wonder if you'd settle a bet for me. Any boats leaving tonight for foreign ports? Nope. <laughs> you sure of that? Positive. No liners until next Saturday. Well, thanks, Mitch. That's all I... Uh, wait, hold it, Guffy. Ask him about private boats. Some people are never satisfied. Say, Mitch, how about private boats? Nothing there either, I suppose. <laughs> nope. You lose, Guffy. What? Yeah, we just cleared a private job sailing for Havana in the morning. She's called the Driftwood. She was chartered by a Mr. Stewart. Nick, I don't think Stewart's here. No one tried to stop us from coming aboard. Maybe you can say that again. Let's try the cabin. Can't you see no one's inside? There's no light. Guffy, 
Sometimes your powers of deduction amaze me. Okay, wise guy. We'll try the cabin, and then it's back to a cell for you. Fair enough. No tricks, pal. You first. All right. Now turn on the lights. Allow me, sir. Huh? Hey, this ain't Stuart. You're right. Gee, I'm sorry, mister. I didn't mean to... Holy smoke! It's... It's Carol! No! No, it can't be! <laughs> While you're making up your collective minds, I'll trouble you for your gun, Sergeant. Ah, thank you. But we... We saw your body! <laughs> it's delightful. In that case, you're disturbing the dead. Isn't that a penal offense, Nick? I don't get it. If this guy is Carol... Who's the stiff in the morgue? Stuart. Stuart? Of course. <laughs> the next thing you'll be saying, Nick, is that you knew it all along. I did. <clears throat> You're second guessing, my boy. You're as surprised as they are. Not quite. I'll reconstruct it for you. Please do. Carol, you were hot. Very hot. And you knew the police would go on searching for you until they caught you. Or they were satisfied you were dead. <laughs> go on. So, hit on the fantastic plan of murdering yourself. It's only one trouble. You had to supply the police with a, with a corpse. But that was easily remedied. Stuart was approximately your size, and he was convenient. So you killed him. <laughs> That's marvelous. And just as you figured, I was accused of your murder. Heaven knows I had plenty of motive after you kidnapped Nora. <laughs> Did you like that touch? It was my idea of poetic justice. Uh, unfortunately, it boomeranged. When I saw the body in the morgue, I knew it wasn't you. Why not? All the clothes are mine. That's why it didn't add up. Guffy, remember when you showed me the wound on the corpse? You had to open his shirt. Yeah? Well, why wasn't there a bullet hole in the shirt? There should have been one. That's right. There's only one thing that would explain it. Clothes didn't belong to the corpse, and if the clothes were Carol's, then the body wasn't. A beautiful piece of logic, Nick. Thanks. And that wasn't a bad plan of yours either. A pity we had to spoil it. At this moment, I find it very easy to forgive you. Well, that's mighty kind of you. <laughs> Not at all, my boy. After all, no harm's been done. I'm sure my little secret will be safe with you and the fishes. What fishes? Nick, I'm afraid your friend is a trifle on the dull side. You see, Sergeant, since you three are the only... Three. Where's Nora? Right behind you, Mr. Carroll. <sighs> Hey, she really conked him. Nora? Nora, darling, how did you get there? It was simple, dear. While you and Mr. Carroll were conducting your mutual admiration society, naturally you both had eyes for no one else. So I edged up behind him and let him have it with my little belaying pin. Belaying pin? Where'd you find that? On deck. I picked it up as a little gift for Sergeant Guffey. What's that? Well, in case we didn't find our murderer here, you would have insisted on dragging Nick off to jail. I guess you're right. I wouldn't have listened to reason no matter how much you argued. But what's that got to do with this belaying pin? Well, I figured this was the one argument that was bound to make a deep impression on you. A quick reminder to every woman tonight, get a jar of Woodbury cold cream, the cream that will help give you, like the loveliest stars in Hollywood, a smoother, more glamorous complexion. And for the most thrilling face powder you've ever tried, ask for the new Woodbury face powder. Remember, the adventures of the thin man are brought to you each week at this time by the makers of Woodbury face powder and Woodbury cold cream, those twin aids to the loveliness of your skin. This is Leo Frascator speaking and reminding you to listen for Asta's Merry Bark. That was The Adventures of the Thin Man, Valentine's Day episode from February of 1942. 
Our cast for this performance was Leo Frascatore as the announcer, Daniela Delarfano as Nora, Michael Crowder as Nick, Elijah Pacheco as Stuart and Guffey, Julian Gotianko as Carol, Peter Reardon as Bunny, Michael Turner as Walter and Louie. Live Foley sound effects and additional voices were provided by John Bagby and Emily Hallenbeck. These performances were recorded and presented using original scripts from the 1940s and directed by Andrew Call. Thank you for joining us. We hope you have enjoyed this nostalgic episode of the Radio Plays Project. The stage manager for the Radio Plays Project is Rebecca Straneri, with assistance from Emily Hallenbeck and Caitlin Litwalk. Sound recording and design by Bell Mendoza, with technical support from John Bagby, Scott Seeger, and Matthew Grenier. Special thanks to Lisa Miller, Jared Stanley, and Dave Giese for their contributions. I'm Jillian Canavan. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Radio Plays Project. Lending a kiss or two, no words can define. And to think such loveliness is mine to possess oh darling you're so 